work in beer. So, uh, so I think we're now to the part of the night that, that hopefully is the one that you guys are actually here for, hearing from these five smart brains instead of, instead of listening to you. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, want to introduce everyone on the panel, but uh, maybe before then, just uh, a couple of ground rules. I want to make this, or not even ground rules. Uh, I want to make this as interactive as possible and sort of really give you guys the opportunity to to ask questions and, and learn what you want to learn. Uh, so we we have a broad spectrum of experience here, ranging from very early stage all the way through to, to much later stage. Uh, so the shape of the discussion is, is a little bit sort of walking through those stages. Uh, but as much as possible, we want to know and, and learn about sort of the, the things that interest you guys and uh, direct the panel that way. So, uh, please, whatever you want, you know, feel free to, to raise your hand and we'll figure out something. We'll definitely do sort of a longer Q&A at the end. Uh, so without further ado, you guys want to maybe introduce yourselves and uh, talk a little bit about your, your background, how you ended up in product management. Hey, so my name is Kevin Steigerwald. Uh, I'm a founder and head of product at Notion. Uh, we're based out of Portland, Oregon. Um, I would say we're one of the is that class for Portland, or is that something we did last? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'd say we fall into that early stage uh, startup. You can tell by the color and amount of hair. Uh, they to look where you want to direct your questions at. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're the amount of hair, by the way. So, you know, that joke went over it. Um, but yeah, no, so I am head of product, so kind of fell into the role of product management through a previous startup, and that's what brought me here, and excited to answer questions and talk to you guys. Testing. Look at that. First uh, I'm Jess Sherlock. I am senior product owner at GoSpotCheck, which is a mobile data collection platform. Um, believe it or not, big enterprises are really terrible at collecting data from the field. A lot of them use email and spreadsheets, so we're here to help as the enterprise gets uh, more sophisticated with their mobile technology. So I've been around since uh, employee number 26. We're now at 93. So we're growing big time. Um, so hopefully I can shed some light on what that's been like. Uh, my background is um, in user experience design. So uh, I come from less of a technology slam, more of a design slam. So hopefully speak to that a bit too. Thanks, Jess. Um, so now I'm, I'm Dan Pinsetley. I work at uh, Pivotal. Hopefully some of you have heard of Pivotal. Um, Pivotal Tracker. Anybody using it? Yeah, Pivotal Tracker. Uh, so yeah, I run Tracker. I've been doing so for, for years now. It's starting to be a part to keep track of how long it's been. And I guess I, I do represent like the legacy product now. We're like way past the you know, whatever stages you're talking about. Um, Tracker's been around for Maybe there's some people in the back that might know exactly, but I want to say about 12 years. Uh, I used to be an engineer at Pivotal, and I just kind of stumbled onto uh, being a PM because someone needed to take care of Tracker, which was a kind of an internal tool at the time. And so I kind of took it from, from that. I sort of figured out how to do product management, I think, at least a little bit. Um, over the years, we launched it into a paying product. We've kind of grown it. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of maintenance issues that we have to deal with. We have a lot of users, a lot of customers, a lot of conflicting, you know, uh, feedback and demands and requests. Uh, so that's what I do. And I guess I like doing that because Tracker is so prevalent in the startup community. It's, uh, it's a tool that really helps PMs from my perspective. I mean, we can't imagine building and maintaining Tracker without having Tracker to use for collaboration and managing our backlog, et cetera, right? So that's kind of keeps, that keeps me going and, and just seeing all the places the Tracker's used, you know, by people like you guys. Thanks, Dan. Uh, my name is Jim Semek. I'm one of the founders of Product Plan and we're a Tracker user. And uh, I've been in product management for, uh, let's just say, a little more than 10 years. <laughs> Um, I have been an early stage person uh, most of my career, uh, helping launch uh, products, starting with a blank sheet of paper, and uh, then playing the product management role. And so I have a lot of experience in new product development and customer development for some successful SaaS products, including go to my PC, go to meeting, uh, B2B SaaS company called Appfolio, and now product plan. And, uh, uh, and also, I've uh, done early stage market validation 
and customer development for products that have never seen the light of day. So I have a lot of experience with, uh, with customer development, and so you know, during the course of this session, if you have questions around you know, how do you figure out the MVP, how do you figure out what customer to sell to, how do you figure out the price, I have a lot of experience around that. I've got some questions for you. My name's Aaron. Um, I've, I've been in the product world for about 15 years. Um, I was employee number six and first product person at Cirrus MD. Uh, not a co-founder, but I work like one. And um, so we're at, we're at 26 now. Uh, we actually hired our sixth engineer yesterday. Um, Pre-series A virtual healthcare platform founded here in Denver. Happy to talk to you guys today. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Um, so maybe starting at the sort of towards the very very beginning of the the life cycle of a company or a product. You know, when it's uh, just a group of founders or a, or a group of folks that are in those very early stages of trying to figure out how to bring an idea to market. Um, this is probably mostly to, to Kevin and to, to Jim. Uh, whoever else wants to jump in, feel free. Um, what uh, what skills and areas of focus do you guys feel like are most important at that stage for someone with a product mindset to focus on. Uh, if they were to try and prioritize the best way to spend their day at that particular agent stage, uh, what should they be focusing on and how should they go about it? Sure. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing that from, from a skill set that I think you need at that stage is curiosity. Um, it's very easy to, uh, I shouldn't say easy, but it, it's it can be easy to like lock yourself into that mentality of, oh, I have the perfect idea, I have these 10 stories, these 100 stories, whatever it is, this is how the product works, and then just think you're going to start building it. And you need to like almost every day wake up and say, well, why are we going to do that? Why does that work? I haven't proven that yet. And I know Jim uh, will be able to talk to a lot of the validation that they went out and did before they did any line of code. Um, but from our own experience building Notion, you know, Dave, my co-founder and I, we started, it was going to be a mobile app that helped teams within organizations uh, track OKRs, and the name Notion kind of came as a pun off of Hoshin Kankri, which is a, a Japanese, uh, similar to like the, the lean process, and that's another one of the process of continuous improvement, right? We wanted a way for employees to continuously get better, and so we thought, okay, we need a mobile app so employees from any stage of the day can just kind of like quickly say, yes, I'm improving this or I'm not, and there's a feedback loop going up the chain. And we did, I, I have wireframes, I have stories, all that written in, in the archives because we woke up every morning and said, well, is this really a bad idea? And uh, we kind of pushed all, all the points of, of interest there and did a lot of investigation, talked to a lot of customers, potential customers, and realized that you know, that, that wasn't a viable thing that they really needed. There was this other pain point of they have this data, they want to bring it all together, and that's kind of what we're responding to. Now, now we're a, a tool designed to, to bring data from all these different tools that you use into, into a single location. Um, but we never would have gotten there. We, we didn't stay curious, and we didn't stay kind of locked into our initial idea and said, let's just build that. Yeah, I'll definitely echo what Kevin says about being curious. And as product people, we love products. We live and breathe products. And there's a tendency when you're considering a new product to be very product focused, to think about the features that you'll be building in the product and um, how cool it's going to be and what underlying technologies we're going to use to build this product. And that's actually a danger in my experience because a product in a business is much more than simply what you're delivering to, to customers. It's really the whole business model. It includes the price that you're going to charge, it includes the customer segment that you're going to target, it includes the way that you talk about the product. And uh, so there's a real tendency in, in our world to, to be very product specific. And when we first start talking to potential customers about these products, to put prototypes in front of them and start talking about all the great things that these products are going to do. And in my experience, it's best to kind of take a step back and use uh, cur have curiosity and use products and, and uh, tools like the business model canvas. Think about the business in its entirety. How is this business actually going to make money at the end of the day? Who 
who am I going to target and how can I target those people on a, on a, on a, on a basis that will scale. And so uh, I've done this with, with uh, the other uh, products that I've been involved with and with product plan because it was partly my business, I really took that to heart. And we interviewed dozens and dozens of product managers, really trying to understand the underlying pain that they have around product road mapping and being able to communicate the product strategy before we decided to build the product, before we started talking to them about the actual features that we could build as part of the product, and definitely before we started writing line of code. And so those are the things that I think about when starting a new a new business or a new product. So how do you, in that same vein, how do you balance the sort of the tenacity of having a, a single idea that you that you feel like there's a need for that you want to push forward with letting the market dictate what it's actually able to accept or what, what customers will actually buy? Those, those obviously those two tendencies are always in uh, are always in contrast. What's the what's the right balance point there? Yeah. So I, I like to live by the by that 80-20 rule that it's it's possible to understand just enough in order to make a decision. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have uh, every uh, possible feature figured out ahead of time. But you need to know enough and build enough to satisfy the core pain. And in my experience, it's possible to launch products and deliver 80% of what a customer really needs, and they still walk away very happy because you've solved most of their problem. And then from that point, you can iterate on the product and make it better and eventually scale. Excellent. So, uh, so let's maybe zoom just a little bit further along in the sort of product company life cycle, maybe from, uh, from that sort of very initial early stage to uh, you're starting to achieve some sense of faith, you're starting to build out a team. And maybe sort of personally as a, uh, as a founder or an engineer, you're transitioning into a role where your focus is actually the products uh, from whatever it was before, from being a generalist into actually sort of focusing on the product as a, as a sole entity. Uh, what, are the, what are the sort of key things to keep in mind during that transition? What are the, the challenges that you all ran into over the course of that? Uh, and how would you, what advice would you give to others in the same spot? So this was before me, but one of my favorite stories about Go Spot Check is how we started. So we started as a mystery shopping company. So five or so years ago, it was a big deal to pay somebody a buck. They'd go to 7-Eleven, make sure that the rack of Pepsis looks right. Um, you'd make a dollar, and then you'd go about the rest of your life. Go Spot Check was probably that app that you used. Um, and after some period of time in the market, I think what's really interesting is that the founders um, as they continue to try to sell big companies and hey, let us be your platform for mystery shopping. Um, they were able to listen to the real need uh, from some of these customers and one in particular who said, hey, we already have a field team that goes out and checks the quality of product. And it would have been really easy to say, yeah, yeah, you know what, you're not a good fit and move on. But instead what they did was say, like, hey, that's kind of interesting. Maybe you could use our product for that. Um, and that's now what GoSpot Check looks like. So instead of trying to uh, force fit a business that really from a revenue standpoint was tricky to manage um, into more of an enterprise model where they were able to generate reliable revenue, um, I, I just think back to the curiosity and keeping your ears open and really not um, staying too myopic, taking that as an opportunity instead of a challenge or trying to force fit that solution to that customer it was really well, well chosen by the founders of GoSpot Check. Similar story for Cirrus MD. When I started, I was actually the product guy that they hired that the founders hired. So I'm not a founder turned product. The, the founder was dying and needed, needed help with the product. So um, the first thing that I did is, is actually very similar to what you said, Jess, is that I listened. First of all, I'm in an industry where I knew nothing about anything except probably like all of you in healthcare, you're not in healthcare in the industry, but you're burned by the industry relatively frequent basis. So I would do a lot of listening, um, <coughs> as I said. Our business model was absolutely dead wrong. Um, and I, they were on the tail end of figuring that out. And I had to transition a product that was direct to consumer into much more of an enterprise play myself. And it was a very interesting challenge for me, number one, not having any idea of all of the compliance and regulatory problems that the industry has. Not building a product that isn't just a consumer.
consumer focused workflow, something where I'm actually getting in the way of potentially someone practicing medicine, getting to a medical outcome that I shouldn't really influence with technology. So I, I'm echoing uh, what you say, Jess. Uh, listening was, was probably the most important thing that I could do in that, in that first time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I, I was just going to add something from from a founder perspective specifically. How many founders are in the room? Just a couple. How many people want to be a founder one day? And you're all crazy. Um, <laughs> I would say one of the biggest things you have to do is like once you get into that mindset of okay, now it's time to build a product, and that happens to fall on your shoulders being the PM. The biggest thing that I and I struggle with still and, and did when I was even at larger companies before this is trust. It is you have to trust that your co-founder, the people you've hired to do a specific job, uh, are going to do that job. And if you have your own roles to play, keep your head down on that stuff. Check in even when you need to uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, otherwise, you're going to spend so much of your time. Uh, Worrying about all those things that the product is going to suffer, you know. As a PM, uh, at least from my experience, you're, you know, you're, you're part of the development team, and you know, if you're, the team only as strong as the weakest link. They're all only as strong as the team, the person leading it, or the team leading it, and that often falls onto the sh shoulders of the product management. And so, if you're not focused on that work on a day-to-day -day basis and keeping track with it, then everything's going to fall apart. And so at that point. It doesn't matter worrying about whether we sign you know, the papers from the lawyers or not. Trust that your co-founder, your CEO, he's going to worry about that. Focus on AWS hey, to make points. Do, are, are, are we moving through our backlog? Are we delivering? Are we testing? Uh, so you have to have that trust that everyone else is doing their job as well. I was just going to echo the, the listening part. And I've seen this in, in my own transition from an engineer to a PM, as well as uh, the transition of some of the PMs we've had in our team. Um, as well as a pivotal, right? And, and typically, and especially when somebody goes from engineering, uh, where you know you're all about sort of knowing how to solve a problem, um, you know, having some ideas about what you know you think should be done to solve customer problems, um, and it, it's really hard to let go of that. It's really hard to let go of knowing what the answer is, right? Even when you get a lot of feedback from customers, when you're talking to them, like you're still fishing for that which reinforces what you think you know, or what you think you believe, right? And, and that's just been such an active and difficult transition to the point where like, you let go of that, and you really, really do listen, and you really go beyond what people are asking for, like give me feature X, and understanding why are they asking for that, right? What is the problem that they have? And then arriving at solutions in a much more you know, organic way, following the process, and doing the UX, et cetera. For me, it's been really hard to learn how to listen, and I'm not even sure I'm doing it properly yet, so. So, uh, what do you guys view as the role of, I use guys liberally, guys in me. Um, what do you all view as the role of, of metrics early on in the, those stages of the company, particularly when it's sort of uh, growth and transitioning to a place where you're starting to get traction? Um, what's, what's sort of the right way to use that? What's the, the level of investment to make, and how should those guide your, your process? I'll start. Um, so yeah, it's, it's funny, Notion is a tool to help you track metrics, and so what's great about building that tool is that we get a dog food it. Um, Dan will say the same thing about you know, using Pivotal, building the product, you can use the product. Um, for us, it's, it's one of those things, you, you can track everything or nothing. Uh, we tend to lean on the side and track the, the smallest amount of things as possible, um, because you'll, you'll get lost otherwise. It, it's very easy to lie with data. And if you have some preconceived notion on um, that, uh, you know that, that some bit of data is going to tell you, oh, this is what an engaged customer means, then you're going to be able to find that if you track it, right? And so you kind of have to come to an agreement as, as a team early on what to find success at this stage of the company. And that's the other thing you have to be. Everyone has to be on the same page. Of, is that as you move through different stages of the company, those metrics change, right? So if you're in alpha pre-alpha, if you're in beta, if you're in B1, B2, whatever, those metrics are going to change. And it might be the same metric now, it just has a, a higher threshold, or it might be a completely different metric in general. Uh, so the biggest, biggest thing is that, that we try to 
you know, both teach our, our customers, but then we also been trying to use internally is come to that consensus early as a team, adopt two or three things that you can say, this is for sure, like this is our measure of growth right now. And maybe it's number of signups that you get. Maybe it's you know a certain level of engagement with the product. And so, you know, for us, a tool about adding metrics, you know, our definition of engagement is how many metrics has someone actually added to a dashboard. Because if you don't do that, then you can't use our product. Um, and so it's, it's kind of come to that agreement, identify those things, and, and be willing to change those as, as you grow. And don't get too worried about, you know, vanity metrics, things like total active users. Um, those things really don't matter until your Facebook scale, Twitter scale, and that's the only number that's going to matter to you in terms of going out and raising billions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's SaaS. So for us, it's MRR, monthly recurring revenue. That tells a pretty big story, especially in enterprise where the sales cycles are long and the contracts tend to be long. Uh, so MRR is a big one. Uh, churn as well is huge, and understanding why customers are churning um, can be really, really valuable. Active users, I think, for us is important, but it's secondary. Uh, we have a model where companies purchase for their users, so usage by happy users tends to drive better data, which makes for a happier customer. So we sort of run the situation where it's some of the standard SaaS metrics, but uh, some metrics that we have to look through a slightly different lens because of the enterprise influence. We track uh, the data on our platform tells our sales story. So, and I don't think I'm saying anything too uh, crazy for that, but if you think about the type of deal that we do as a uh, telemedicine platform, we're essentially doing, uh, we're helping large health systems, insurance providers, payers, uh, provide the, the appropriate cost of care. People <coughs> misuse urgent cares, they misuse doctor visits, they misuse emergency room visits. If you can picture how much it costs to have a 10 minute encounter on my virtual care platform versus a two day ER admission, the day, that, that ROI calculation that we can show from the data that we're capturing on our platform helps us close deals. So, yeah, we track a lot of the nitpicky stuff within the app and the platform. I don't think that's exactly where the question is going, but we use data and key metrics to help us actually gain new customers. One of the other ways that we use data is uh, obviously to instrument, I mean, again, we have first SaaS app as well, and all the things that just said apply to us as well, like the key drivers are, you know, monthly recurring revenue churn, et cetera. Uh, but we also use it just to kind of instrument what people are doing, right, in the app, how often they're doing, um, what does, you know, how much information is on the page when they're doing a certain given thing. And there's really great tools out there these days for this, like Mixpanel is one of them. That's what we use. We spend a lot of money on Mixpanel, so be careful, like the cost of using these um, sort of instrumentation slash engagement metric services. Like, once you're hooked, you're going to just keep adding more and more data because you, you start relying on, on having that data there to be able to ask arbitrary questions, right? Like, if we're designing a new feature, right, we can, and actually our designers are one of our heavier uh, users of mixed metal these days. Like, they're, 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 they're building funnels, they're doing segmentations, they're looking at retention. Uh, it helps you shape a solution, right? Because you know exactly how people are using your product. Again, like how much information they're interacting with on, on any given day, you can segment. Right, and sort of tie it back to the personas you built in design. So having that kind of fine grain engagement data is really awesome, but it is expensive for a campaign. Yeah, definitely echo what I've heard here, which is track a few key metrics. And for us, at the beginning, because it was a, a brand new startup, uh, we were very much focused on is this a viable business model. And so it's very focused on the sales model. How do we acquire a customer? How much does it cost to acquire a customer? What's the conversion rate from the visit on the web page to trial? What's the conversion rate from trial to paid? And then what's the average deal size? So very focused, and it still is very focused on that. And we do have an understanding of some of the, the customer engagement metrics, those things that indicate whether someone's going to be successful in our product. Have they, how many, how many initiatives have they planned on the roadmap? How many times have they shared the roadmap out? So those sorts of, uh, those sorts of metrics, but still, key focus is on those business metrics uh, for us. And I imagine as we scale and mature, we'll get more refined on those customer success metrics. 
Um, and we do have certainly an understanding of churn and, and measures like that. Um, but uh, very, very heavily weighted towards business. Is this one live? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Um, so another question, uh, it's sort of a little bit different than the, the metrics one, but uh, you know, I, I think a common issue for sailing companies across uh, across a lot of different industries, across, across a lot of different areas, is the relationship between product and design and engineering. Uh, particularly at sort of those, those sheer pressure points when you're starting to scale, different teams are scaling at different rates, different parts of the company are scaling at different rates. How do you uh, how do you manage that relationship and that dynamic uh, as the, the company, the product, the team scales uh, and sort of keep it in a, in a spot where you're able to deliver consistently moving forward? very well. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> Um, I think this has been something that's been really, really cool in our industry over the last few years, right? How these, you know, maybe thought of them as different disciplines, right? Or these separate disciplines, like engineering is like the building of it, right? Product is the like knowing what to build and why and for whom, right? And then like passing that over to engineering. And then here's, you know, the designers over in the other corner, like just kind of making pretty things and you know, pushing pixels, right? Like, wow, that's really changed. And like, nobody thinks this way anymore, except a lot of companies still, unfortunately, have those really kind of distinct uh, uh, divisions or even walls between them. Um, you know, at Pivotal, we've been sort of just naturally thinking like, no, you are one team, you're building a product, you're solving a problem. Um, you know, even before, like, the buzzwords, like the balance team or the cross-functional team, but like, to me and to us, it just made perfect sense. We're like, these are overlapping roles, right? Like, and nobody really knows how to be the product manager. Like, just because you're playing, you're wearing that hat, doesn't mean that you're like this, you know, uh, divine figure that knows everything. And the designer isn't gonna be, you know, bringing everything to the table as far as like how to solve a problem. Like, getting those roles to work together, side by side, sitting together, pairing, right? Like, we've been doing a lot of. Uh, the sort of cross-functional pairing lately. Like Pivotal is obviously known for engineering pairing, and that's been the case ever since day one, and like that hasn't changed. But now we're starting to see designer pairing with the PM on what? Well, validation, building prototypes, user research, interviews. Like sometimes the designer drives it, sometimes the, the PM does it, unless the PM is you know on a customer call. In which case, the designer will pull in an engineer, and they will go to a user or customer interview on, on Zoom or Skype or visit together, right? So like the lines between the specialties are starting to blur. Um, and I think that's such a great thing. And you know, I'm all about like building and maintaining these like tight-knit small teams that have every role that's needed for the given problem. And you almost stop calling people by their titles or whatever, right? Like it's not a UX designer, you're not just designing the user experience, you're designing and building a product, right? You're not a software engineer, you're a product developer. We're together building this thing that's going to solve a business problem, a customer problem. Um, so anyway, I think that's been the recognition lately, like, yeah, we need to work together, right? And we're just wearing different hats, sometimes we're wearing two hats, you know, sometimes just one. Let's sit together, let's let's align to like the problem that we're trying to solve, and like, let's just do everything we can together, together. And I'll uh, uh, just mention at, at, at a company I used to work with, uh, at Folio, a B2B software company, uh, it was uh, part of our process to have these cross-functional teams, to actually bring in UX and even someone from sales in addition to product as part of the customer interviews to really understand the voice of the customer and the customer problems. And, and getting and bringing in UX at that early stage rather than simply some something that you throw over the fence at the end of the process to create some much better products in my experience. So um, I, I, I think that's a really uh, uh, an, an important thing to do to bring in those teams really early on and make them cross-functional. Me first. So yeah, so at Ghost Project, what's pretty interesting, at one point I was the first product hire outside the founder, uh, so Joy Alfano's CPO hired me, um, and I had the luxury, I suppose, of being the sole product manager for about 14 engineers, no QA, no design. <laughs> I did have some of the gray hair, 
<laughs> you just can't see it. Uh, but yeah, no, so it's been a trick because ever since then we, we realized uh, coming from pivotal roots, actually having pivots develop B1 and go spot check that having what was what made go spot check in the early stages really successful was these small, really nimble, agile teams. Um, and so we, we were really inspired by the pivotal model, by the Spotify model of trying to identify the skill sets that you need on a team to be productive for the product that they're working on. And I think the proximity plays a key role in that, but, but the gotchas are really what we're experiencing now, which is like, you have to have clear accountabilities and you have to figure out the communication blocks that can happen because you've in essence created silos and those silos are optimizing for movement and, you know, really successful uh, production within the team, but it's also optimizing for gaps in communication. So how do you make sure that you're not solving the same problem four different times? How do you make sure that tool sets are consistent between teams? Um, so not only have we built these agile teams with a mix of developers and QA and design and, and product, but also figuring out the right you know, chapters in the Spotify mindset of how do we make sure all the product owners are talking to each other? How do we make sure all the designers are talking to each other? So I think what I would say is like look in organizations, it, it, either in your current organization or in organizations you're looking to work with, try to make sure that there is that balance between those independent teams, but have they and are they considering how those um, disciplines communicate and are there clear accountabilities? Because if multiple people own something, no one owns it. So I think it's really important to, to clarify that and make sure that those things are in place. Totally, yeah. I mean, process, of course, is very important. Um, we're very small, uh, six engineers, a creative director, one product person, and a data analyst, an analytics person. Communication is the only way. It's just like any relationship that you're in. You've got to talk. When you stop talking, shit breaks down pretty quickly. Um, and also, and I don't know if this is going to be a great segue for you, Jay, but uh, you've, you've got to hire well. Um, luckily, we're at a place where you know, we caught a bad hire and we made an adjustment and we've been able to hire well since then. And I think for, you know, at, at a 26 total employee company, nine people on the product team, we don't have room for a bad hire. And uh, so I would say communication, a little bit of process, and definitely talent. Uh, I'll, I'll just Real quickly, try to tie together too, uh, to bring it back to a point I think you made in your talk is, you know, it's, it's the rocks and the sand analogy again, where you don't just want to do that from the tech side, build that framework, you also want to do it with your company. So if you are small, or if you're the first PM uh, in your company, you have that opportunity to start to carve that out, because the hope is you're going to scale, you're going to grow your team, um, and it's much harder to, you know, add any new process uh, to the process. Uh, further down the line. Just make sure you guys are listening. Uh, but so for, for us, it's, you know, even when we were just a, a single developer and myself, you know, we, we were in uh, track and, and we didn't need to be. Like, I, I could easily just say, hey, Chris, is this done yet? And he'd say, yes. Uh, but we got in the habit of, let's actually have sprint plan, let's actually estimate this, uh, even though it felt like busy work. But we knew as soon as you have your second developer, they're going to ask us, well, how do you guys estimate points? How do you, what, you know, what's a typical sprint look like? And if we said, oh, we just kind of wing it, then he was just going to wing it too. And that, like, that sets the habit and the culture for your company from, from an early day. And so that, that goes across the board, right? And so we do things every two weeks, we pull the entire team together, admittedly small, but you know, it's from the CEO to account managers to developers uh, and product, and we're all in the room together when we have, we call it product product. Let's just talk about product features and everyone's perspective on it. We're not trying to figure out how we're going to build this from the dev side. We're not worried about estimating or breaking down tasks. It's just, here's a problem we heard. How can we solve this? Get everyone's opinion. We do the same thing with you know, user experience testing. Uh, every two weeks we get together and Laura, our other PM, who's focused on user testing, she presents all the new findings. Uh, our account manager puts together weekly docs for us that we go through all the things he's learned. So it's, it's about setting those habits early. It's, it's the, those rocks so that when your team scales and come back to it, all that process is in place. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to do, I think, one more question and then open it up to the, the group. So start thinking about what you want to want to ask these folks now, and we'll, we'll be back to you in just a minute. Uh, so one other, and I promise this isn't 
directly a softball question. I think it's a relevant one, but given that Jim's product does exactly this, it's probably going to seem like it. Um, so I feel like road mapping is one of the sort of one of the most challenging uh, exercises within the product space, right? The balancing all the needs of different stakeholders within that, uh, communicating it out appropriately, having that adjust to businesses. Um, what strategies and techniques have you all found for, uh, for successfully sort of managing roadmaps and using that as an effective tool to manage uh, your product and your platform and your team? We, we use product plan. <laughs> So that you can hopefully have the conversation of 
should it be? And if so, why? So you can maintain that curiosity. Because I think like what's easy to forget is when you're living and breathing product and making those decisions day to day. Sales doesn't know what you're doing. CSMs don't know what you're doing. They don't know what you've chosen not to do. And so it's really important for that air cover and communication um, to really make sure that either they pull you out of the zone if they need to, or you know they let you focus on that zone if they agree with it. But I, I think it just it's that communication tool, and it deserves to be revisited. We actually have four. One of our product owners is sitting in the back. We have four that we're trying to figure out how or if we show internally and externally. Um, but they only go out a quarter, and even just that quarter is really freaking us out. But we're, we're trying to figure it out too. We'd love your thoughts. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure where to start with my Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was admiring the product in San Francisco uh, about this time last year, and how many of you uh, are familiar with Mind the Product? And, uh, and, and then a little while after that, I went to a product camp uh, in LA, and, and uh, Marty Kagan spoke. And there were a couple of, um, there were a couple of events of Mind the Product and in Product Camp where people were talking about roadmaps as evil. And I actually agree with that in some sense because the context of most roadmaps is that it's this document that's dreamed up in the boardroom somewhere, some executive round table. And the problem with that is that that's presumed by the organization to be the right thing to do. And so the, the problem with roadmaps in a lot of organizations, especially larger organizations, is that this roadmap doesn't change based on new things that you learn in your organization. It's not agile. And it's dreamed up by some executive or a really loud sales executive in the room who says, we have to have this feature in order to close this customer. And there's not a whole lot of discussion around the why. There's not a lot of discussion around why are we doing this to begin with? And then as circumstances change, as competitors come in the market, uh, as you find out that something turned out to be harder to build than you thought, or maybe the scope of something maybe wasn't as big as you thought it was, those things aren't introduced into the roadmap. And so, and so I do think that a lot of organizations tend to come up with this, you know, one year or in some cases two year roadmaps of this is what is the right thing to do. And I could disagree more with that process. So the way that we think about roadmaps is that it is something that is um, a communication uh, vehicle. It's a way of having a conversation with your stakeholders, maybe even your customers, around where you're headed and why. And so um, this idea that a roadmap is the backlog, that's not really the way that I think about it. Uh, the roadmap really isn't the list of features. It's really, um, we like to think about it as themes. These big picture items of what you want to accomplish and why. And how those items relate back to the strategic goals for the organization or for the customer. And so those are great roadmaps because then you get the conversation going in the organization about why are we doing this to begin with. And so the roadmap, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of folks, is that it should be constantly evolving and we're gonna be having a conversation around this, at least monthly, about why it is that we're doing what we're doing. And, um, and so what we try to coach is to, for people to get away from these one year or two year long roadmaps that say, we're gonna be building this in Q3 of 2018. And even moving away from date-driven product roadmaps and start having roadmaps that really show the priority behind what you're doing and not exactly the delivery date. And I think all of us here are really, uh, we're, we're in smaller organizations. And so there's no way that we can predict in even Q4 of this year what it is that we're going to accomplish. So we can't be making these promises to our customers. We should probably know we all work for software companies. So if you have a hardware component, it's a roadmap probably is a little bit, maybe easier to manage, more important, better to publish, more of a document set in stone, <laughs> or, or if you work, or if you happen to work in a company that's like public, or you know, is like super eager to go public, it's like you're gonna have these conversations with your finance partner 
about you know four fiscal quarters out, right? And then okay, you make a spreadsheet that gives you a lot of wiggle room, and then they go away, right? Um, but I think like just because you manage a roadmap only sort of like the near term, like more than just in time, two three months out, you know, it's a communication vehicle. Like you still want to have kind of like a you know a long term vision, right? But that is not again like what seventy four features by whatever two years from now, but like what kind of a product do you want to be for whom, right? What do you want to be? What do you not want to be, right? Like we've been constantly on our team getting questions like, well, what is our vision here, Dan? Like, what are we really doing? We're doing this and this. Look at our roadmap. Yeah, but what are we really here for, right? It's like, okay, existential stuff, right? But I think that's important too. And that is more stable. That kind of defines your purpose in the world, I think. And I think it helps to validate your roadmap. Like, are these things that we have on the roadmap right now taking us toward that vision. Uh, our design team lately has been talking about, you know, having a North Star. I think this is something that's kind of coming up a lot more in, in like design circles, like what is our North Star? Right? And that could be a product North Star, it can also be like a design North Star that helps guide you at every increment. But then you are planning incrementally, right, the themes, the epics, the stories. But when you once in a while you look up and you go, are we moving toward that North Star? Is it still north of us? Um, yeah. Cool. So I'm resisting the urge to ask, what is your vision here, Dan? Uh, and so I'm going to go on to, uh, to questions from the audience if anyone has. Yes, perfect. Hello, Dan. Uh, so you talked to someone mentioned something about dates. I think it was the lovely man from Potter Plan. Um, so, talking about specific features, so we've all, not all, but probably been on the call where you talk about a feature, you explain to a customer, and they say, oh, okay, great, when is it coming out? And that's the main focus of the conversation. Or you've been on the sales, you've been on the customer support, and it's all focused on marketing. When is the feature coming out? So I'm just interested, if you're going through the scoping process for a particular feature, or you do story pointing, um, how often, how do you manage that expectation of setting a date and meeting that date? And how do you have those conversations when you feel like you're unsure about that date? Because maybe you've been burned in the past when you haven't met that date, which has all happened to all of us. So, uh, one of my favorite techniques is to totally skip that question. My team hates this. But something I found really effective is to, um, first of all, are we actively working on it or not? If the answer is that we're not, then there's no such thing as a deadline, but I'd love to talk to you more about why that's interesting. If we are actively working on it, then I don't talk about deadlines at all. I tend to talk about milestones and dependencies, and hopefully a good chunk of those fall on the customer. Um, but usually I try to focus on the things that we can deliver and the milestones that we would need to hit. Um, I'm currently working on an integration product uh, project, standardizing um, an integration with like an outside vendor that we work with a lot. And um, that's come in really handy because it refocuses the discussion towards progress instead of end, because it's never really done. Um, so, it, it, for me, anyways, it produces a more successful conversation. So, like, Agile has this, uh, you know, this bad reputation where, like, you can't talk about days, right? Like, there are no days in Agile. You just do stuff and it just comes, right? <laughs> I mean, like, yes, okay, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so, I mean, we've always been in situations where, like, we're, you know, replying to some support ticket, we're talking to a customer, and, like, we're talking about some feature that we know is coming out because we're working on it, or, like, Literally, but we're gonna like we're gonna ship it tomorrow. We're gonna release it. It's in tomorrow's like release notes already, and everything. So we say, oh, Friday or Monday, right? And then like 98% of the time, like no, that's pull the release. And then it's like two weeks later, like well, I thought you're gonna right? Like we just really try to avoid those conversations. However, maybe not in our team, but like other parts of Pivotal, um, Cloud Foundry, they are big, huge, complicated paths, right? They don't. They're not SaaS. They ship versions of the product, right, that you download, they have, we have the feel selling these like multi-million dollar deals where time, dates, kind of matters because there's all these things downstream that depend on that past version getting delivered with that feature, there's coordination with like other teams. So dates very much matter, right? And they basically ship like once a month. Um, and 
what they do is they make the dates be the hard milestone. So therefore, you have the other variable to, to manage, right, which is scope. So just manage scope. Keep the date, manage scope. Easy, right? And I mean, it's kind of like, I say it like, oh, it's really easy, but like it's one of the two, right? Like, either keep your date fixed and then go crazy cutting scope, and you're going to have to, or, right, like just maybe focus on the scope because you want to deliver something really delightful, and then, yeah, you need to have room, and you cannot make commitments to anybody about when you're going to, when you're going to ship it. You cannot have both. You can't make promise about time and scope, and that's all it comes down to. Uh, I'll add to that quickly, and whether or not this was the exact question, but being what you wonder it, in that like specific scenario, if you're trying to like, how do I get out of having that tough conversation in, in that moment, just say, let me talk to the dev team and I'll get back to you. And it's, 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 not, it's not like a total weasel move, because you may really do have to talk to them, but it's like, even if you're actively working on it, if you actively know the due date, as soon as you say that date, that's then what the customer is going to expect. And so it's about managing that expectation. And so and we're, we're early stage. And so we are constantly, we get that question once a week easily, uh, if not more. Um, thankfully, uh, a lot of times it's things that we are actively working on. So we know A, we're building the right thing, but B, we can tell them with some level of certainty it's going to be coming soon. But it's always like we back out of that by saying, let me get back to the, let me talk to the dev team, I'll get back to you. It's great because then it creates another touch point you have with that customer to follow up with them. Um, but then it also allows you to kind of take a minute and ask your team, like, hey, they're asking for this feature, um, why? Right? Because it, it's not something on your roadmap. You want to take that step back and say, why do they want this or need this? Is there another way they can achieve it? Can we deliver something faster? And that's where I think it's dance point. That's where you can start to manage scope. And so they want X, but can we actually get it to them if we do Y? twice as fast, is that worth doing, so. And just to echo the, the sort of like, talking to the customer and like not giving them some DSX or like, we don't give dates, but like, saying a date and then you know as soon as that date is coming out of your mouth, like, you start to feel kind of slimy inside because you know, <laughs> you know it's not gonna happen, you're just like, here's a date, right? Um, but the point is like, we don't give them a date and we say, look, it's actually in our backlog. It's it's a few stories out. You know, I can't promise exactly when, but it's it's definitely coming up. We're we're working on it, right? Uh, and then when you ship it, like have some system so you can get back to all the people that you know email or ask and say, hey, just to follow up. I know it's been a few weeks, but that feature's there now. We solved that problem. And like usually, like the response to that is like, oh, you guys are great. You followed up. Like I wasn't just like some random someone that you blew off and didn't give me a date, right? Like you actually like give a shit and, and you follow up. But it's hard because you have a lot of stuff to keep track of in that communication chain. Cool. We do probably one more question and then I think these guys, do you want? All right, All right cool. Ronan's keeping us on schedule. Yeah, still here, still here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kevin, earlier you mentioned the importance of setting a product process early on to make sure that you keep building off of that. I'm wondering if any of you have experience of coming into a company uh, when you're too late for that Right? So, for example, six months ago, uh, we were five years old and we decided to have our per first product position ever. Um, and so I came into a company with the role of learning what project management is and teaching the company. Uh, our head of engineering does use Pimple Tracker, so he said, hey, you should probably use this. That was the only, uh, I guess, advice on what product management is that our company had. So I'm just curious if any of you have experience of um, going into a company that doesn't have new process and trying to train everyone while you, you yourself might be new. Um, or, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'll address it quick first in the past, but so I was in that situation at another, my first company uh, that I was working for. I was employed 23, so similar to, to where you came in. Uh, and it was too late into the process to really start to change things, uh, so I started my own company. <laughs> yeah, so I've done a little bit. We've gone through years of like kind of doing this, uh, like early days, like agile coaching, which is similar, right? You're trying to bring some process to a place that has done, right? Or have long cycles, whatever, right? There's some absence of whatever it is that you're trying to introduce. And like, you know, we learned the hard way. You can't come in and to say you should do this and do that, right? Like, that's never going to work, even if they are paying you a lot of money to like be the expert. Like, you really have to, 
and then you like show by example, right? And start small and start with like willing participants. It's like, yeah, let's maybe do one little project here where people kind of want to like, hey, maybe we should have a bit of a structure on how we do things, right? And like do that. I'm like, look, we're just kind of doing something and then like have some success and then start kind of raising your profile visibility. And then others are like, oh, they, that seemed like it was working well. Like maybe we should try it too. And so kind of spread it organically and always have like critical mass of people who want to as opposed to like, it's you versus 10 people who just got assigned by their managers to like, you know, do what you're telling them to do. Like, that's just, that's not gonna be fun. And maybe pointing out the obvious, but they've been around five years, like something's working. So I, I would start by just trying to figure out what is working and, and package it maybe a little bit better or formalize it. Um, but I don't know, something must be working. I felt the same way about Chris Watch. I love him to death now, but man, it was a rocky road. I think, you know, certain things were working, and it was really those like rocks of communication and uh, skill set and talent. But at the same time, like, there's certainly been some roads, and it's a lot of like, get a lot of champions along the way. But it's a process in and of itself. You could also just call it something else, right? Like, whatever they like it to be called. like. You know, like stand-ups, like, oh, you're telling us that stand-ups because, like, you're these agile, you know, whatever, like, like, zealots, right? It's like, no, let's just maybe, uh, you know, have some, some, like, have a little espresso party in the morning, right? We just have some espresso <laughs> and, like, chat with them, right? and before you know, like, oh, we're talking every morning for five minutes and we're talking about, like, what we're going to do that day, like, how dare you? <laughs> you, like, caught us with having stand-ups for, like, good works, right? <laughs> Did we already say that you're hiring a product manager? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, I really don't have a personal experience in that situation, but I've seen plenty of companies where um, the founders have played the role of product management for a long time. And hiring, they realize that it has to be done, but then turning over the reins is very hard. Letting go is very hard. Letting go of their baby is very hard. And so, you know, that's a, that's a difficult and uh, sometimes a political situation to put yourself into. And so I don't have any advice for you other than just go gently and listen and make sure they're heard. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will add some, some actual uh, advice here. Um, actual, yeah, don't start your own company. Um, people fear change, right? So uh, I think you guys are hitting on it. Don't go in and say everything you're doing is wrong, right? Uh, identify the things that aren't working. Um, start small and understand what your goals are. Uh, like this is where you need to have your own kind of a personal roadmap. What, how do I want this team working? Make sure it aligns with your managers, right? Because you, you know your team is going to see you. I mean, and I, I think of product management as a very lonely job. I don't know if anyone feels this. This is not a cry for help. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're working day to day mostly with your developers, but you have this word manager in your title, but you're not really their manager, right? They, they have a development manager if the company's large enough, uh, but they, they almost fear you in that you're just telling them what to do. And so it's kind of like playing this balance of, you know, good cop, bad cop, I'm your friend, uh, but get your shit done. Um, so, yeah, you have to find that balance of start small. Don't tell them they're doing anything wrong. Hey, I'm coming in to you know, introduce these new processes because you've been doing it wrong. It's just finding the ways to, you know, like, Tell them, like, hey, you've been doing this great for so long, but it hasn't really been structured. What are we adding a little bit to it? And document that. Let them give feedback. And that's why we do these this product parties where the entire team comes into the process because it's now no longer me saying, we're building this next. It's at the end of the day, as the product owner, I have to say that, but everyone now understands why we're building that next because they were all in that room when those decisions were made. They all had insight into you know, estimating the stories or estimating the value of that feature. Uh, and you can do the same thing with, with any type of process that you choose. I had a good friend that once described uh, the product management field as the fine art of uh, having responsibility without authority. I feel like that's uh, exactly that. We have uh, one more from the audience. Uh, yeah, Chris. Hey, so hopefully a quick one. Uh, there's a great website called Not Always Right that details the amazing stories of customers who perhaps are not. We talked about being able to listen, 
But what's the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten from a customer, and how do you filter it? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go start first again. Inside the mic. Um, I, I'm working on a theory, and I haven't written it up yet. I'm really waiting for someone to invite me to a, to a larger talk so I can give this. Uh, but there's basically, um, you have six products at, at any given point, even if you're just building one, right? There, there's the product you think you have, the product you're, you're building next, whether that's like a sprint or a quarter, whatever your release cycle is. And then there's the product you wish you had, right? The long-term vision. And then there's the product the customer bought. There's the product that they're giving feedback on. This is what they want the product to be. And then they have their own long-term goals of what they want this product to become, right? And so as that feedback comes in, you really have to like, as, as the manager or a product owner, you have to understand all those different products. And you have to like leave your ego out of it because yes, you have these three versions that you've like assigned your own name to. This is the product I'm selling. This is the product I want to build next. This is where I want it to go. Uh, that's not always going to align with the customer. But at the same time, they're going to like, throw in some idea that might be way out of bounds from just like company vision. Where, where as a company do we want to go? So if someone would say, like, half of our product is really built around integrations. And we get a lot of requests for Salesforce. And we're not going to build Salesforce anytime soon because it is this giant mechanism that doesn't even make sense of how we're going to about to integrate with it. And we would spend all of our time and efforts that we did, and that's where it's like we have to take that feedback and say that's a like a super valid use case. And if anyone wants to build, build a product around here in Salesforce, you're gonna, you're gonna do great. But it doesn't align with our vision, and so you have to be able to balance that against the different products that you have and, and hold fast to where you want it to go. Yeah, I don't know about uh, a customer giving it. Advice, um, but it's important to, and, and if I was going to give you, sir, a, a more uh, serious answer, it's about delicately building a presence inside of your organization, but it's also having a presence with your customers and, and making sure that they know that their voice is being heard, but they're really just, a, they're a voice. Um, additionally, one thing that I struggle with that has gotten a lot easier as we've hired more roles at Cirrus MD, I used to be the, the CSM and the account manager and the product person. So I was the only person in the meeting take, hearing these things from the customers. And I was becoming kind of a political nightmare for myself because if you really, it, I found that it's important in SaaS particularly to have that buffer where you can take all those smiley inbound requests and still have the time to think about them prioritize them against everything else that's going on, and then package that answer back to the customer in a, in a, in a nice way. Um, I struggled with that for a year, and I probably looked like an asshole for a long time. Um, so not, I think it's all about just making sure that, that customers have their voices heard and making sure that they get validated feedback back. Yeah, and I'll add uh, a little bit to that, which is understand your customer's motivation. Uh, understand the why behind why they're asking for a certain thing. When we were building uh, accounting software, uh, we talked to the accountants. And they said that they needed this report, this report, and this report. And at the end of the day, we didn't build those reports because there was a different way of solving the problem. Um, we under tried to understand why are you asking for this, and after you get this report, what do you do with it? Well, the main reason they wanted the report was because it was what their current system did. And they needed to they needed to make sure their process remained consistent. And that was their motivation to not really shake anything up. And so by understanding that motivation, we delivered something to them that was better than simply a report. And then the other uh, uh, thing I'll mention from my product line experience is that customers' motivations are um, sometimes self-serving, so when we heard from a prospect that during our pricing validation that we really should have unlimited flat rate pricing, we decided not to do that. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's give these five folks a hand.